observe. Um, always, uh, uh, you know, Jim always has to outdo me, you know, 32 years, but in five years, I'm going to catch him. Because <laughs> I, th I thought I heard on TV recently that arithmetic doesn't matter anymore. Well, no, okay. <laughs> Anyways, um, well, uh, let's move on. We're, we're, uh, we're running um, a little bit behind schedule, but um, I, I, we want to give our uh, keynote speaker um, uh, all the time, so um, uh, he will uh, uh, go his entirety and we'll be able to question and interact with him and uh, perhaps we'll have a, a slightly shorter break. Um, so um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for AMIA 2012, uh, John Seeley Brown. Um, John Seeley Brown is the independent co-chairman of Deloitte's Center for the Edge and is a visiting scholar and advisor to the provost at University of Southern California, which I think was in a football game yesterday. Um, prior to that, he was chief scientist of Xerox Corporation and the director of its Palo Alto Research Center, who um, those of you who are young might not know that that was a, where a certain prototype of a certain type of computer was uh, first researched and developed, um, the Mac. Um, and it's a position that he held for nearly two decades while head of um, the Palo Alto Research Center or Park. He expanded the role of corporate research to include such topics as the management of radical innovation, organizational learning, complex adaptive systems, and nanotechnologies. He was a co-founder of the Institute for Research on Learning, or IRL, and his personal research interests are many, including digital youth culture, digital media, and institutional innovation. John, or as he is sometimes called, JSB, is a member of the American Academy of Art and Sciences, the National Academy of Education, a fellow of the American Association for Artificial Intelligence, and a trustee of the MacArthur Foundation. He serves on numerous public boards, including Amazon, Corning, and Varian Medical Systems and private boards of directors. He's published over 100 papers in scientific journals, and with Paul DeGood, he co-authored the acclaimed book, The Social Life of Information, that has been translated into nine languages with the second edition in April of 2002, first published in 2000, and I actually read that book and found it very informative in terms of my work. With John Hagel, he co-authored the book, The Only Sustainable Edge, which is about new forms of collaborative innovation, and The Power of Pull, How Small Moves Smartly Made Can Set Big Things in Motion, published in April 2010. His current book, which he was gracious enough to provide some of us signed copies with, is called The New Culture of Learning. I'm sure that this book will actually um, impact me probably more than his previous book. Um, co-authored with Professor Doug Thomas at USC. John received a BA from Brown University in 1962 in mathematics and physics and a PhD from the University of Michigan in 1970 in computer and communication sciences. He's received six honorary degrees, including Brown University, Doctor of Science degree in May 2000, London Business School, honorary, honorary Doctor of Science and Economics in 2001, Claremont Graduate University, Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters, 2004, Octor, Honorary Doctor of Science degree from the University of Michigan in 2005, Honorary Doctor of Science degree from the North Carolina State University in 2009, and finally, Honorary Doctor of Design from Illinois Institute of Technology. So without further ado, I will invite up our keynote speaker. Great. <laughs> Can we have the first slide up? Oh, that's right. That's good. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Well, it was a great honor and pleasure to be here. Um, and Nancy, that video covering your life was truly awesome. Uh, uh, 
I'm glad to see the role of people in there as well, how critical that is. Um, I felt myself a little bit concerned about addressing you all um, because my association with health um, is a strange association. Uh, in the last few years, I've become very focused on what you might call the layer on top of the most uh, massive types of uh, cloud computing you can believe in, looking at how might we actually put a new type of NOC uh, network uh, um, organizational center uh, uh, to be able to manage this worldwide global network with basically zero latency. Now, you have to realize that that, of course, is impossible, uh, but there are some really interesting tricks you can do if you actually can shape um, communication paths all the way through the operating system, all the different levels of the cloud, and so on and so forth. And so I've become very interested in health in complex adaptive systems. Um, and that's what actually brought my perspective to bear on my, uh, on my talk today. Um, I want to actually take a few minutes to uh, walk through with you kind of reimagining healthcare uh, actually from an ecosystemic perspective. And the ecosystemic perspective is where I first started with these massive cloud systems and then um, now mapping them on to how I've been looking at some of the problems that you all are looking at. So let's first look at our context, perhaps first looking at it through a rear view mirror and then looking out the front. Um, I think if you look back over the last century, maybe last three centuries, the thing that characterizes virtually all infrastructures that have defined how we live, work, play, do commerce, et cetera, are basically S-curves. And these S-curves have an interesting property that is, a, of course, a moment of radical transition, often over a 10 or 15 year period, and then tremendous eras of stability, 30, 40, usually 50, 60, 70, 80 years, in which we reenact basically our institutional architectures, how we work, how we live, how we learn, and so on and so forth. Um, for example, our highway system has not changed, electrification has not changed, one iota in a hundred years, and yet to find, for example, in Chicago, how, why we can now have skyscrapers, believe it or not, the first skyscrapers here made possible by electrifying the city to be able to take an elevator up beyond what we could do with hydraulic lifts. So this issue is kind of so deeply interwoven in how we think that I wanted to kind of step back and say, well, you know, yeah, but all of us in this room know that something major has happened. We call it the big shift with the group that I work with at Deloitte. The big shift has happened. And the big shift, I'm going to claim, has happened because we have moved from these errors for the last multiple hundreds of years of S-curves governing the infrastructures of everything we do into a new type of infrastructure, a digital infrastructure, of course, which is driven by exponential laws where there's no sign that these exponential laws are going to slow down. Yes, Moore's Law, I know, has certain limits, and we know how to get around some of those problems with architecture, and we know how to do some stuff with nanotubes and blah, blah, blah. But uh, basically, the end result is we really are moving into a world in which has no stability at all. And basically, I think we're going to see punctuated evolution happening almost every 18 months. I like to sometimes go back, I won't do it here, and just take the last four or so of these, the last six, seven years, and go through how I had to rip up almost everything I knew in order to be able to relearn how to really operate with the next generation, which is one and a half years old uh, of technologies to be able to really understand how to exploit them, how to rethink organizational architectures and so on and so forth. My only point is we have actually moved to a new normal away from an era of constant equilibrium to a place of disequilibrium. And with disequilibrium, we need to really rethink our business models, our ways of working, organizing, innovating. They need to be reframed. And in fact, believe it or not, in the corporate world, where I spend most of my time, IT has been the barrier to much of this innovation. Our legacy systems on IT did not enable us rapidly to be able to appropriate radically new organizational architectures. And as a consequence, the story has been a bit depressing. 
We've been looking at the economic basis of at least North America over the last 50 years or so. And if you actually look at what we're capable of doing with the hard assets that we own in corporations today, return on assets, you will see this is 1965, we have basically dropped 75% of our return on assets. Um, we're going to one quarter of what we're capable of producing with those assets. Now, if this is not obvious, this is almost a story of going out of business for the corporations that define our economy. Um, and as I said, our legacy IT systems have not helped as much here. And how, by the way, do you guys not know this story that well? Why is the press not picked up on it, you might ask? Is because around this sad story, we have a way of covering it up. We don't talk about return on assets anymore. We talk about return on equity. Well, if you look at equity, I won't bore you with it, deep definitions versus assets, we can do all kinds of things with debt financing. That is the tool that we've actually used to actually disguise how little we're actually getting out of our assets. Why do I bring it up here? Because this is not your topic here. I want to say now we have, in this period of constant disequilibrium, we have to likewise think about how we might reframe our approaches to healthcare. And here we have even more powerful technologies than any place else in the world to be able to think about this reframing. We have the great four, I'm going to call them IT pillars that everybody in this room deeply understands. How do we deal with cloud? How do we deal with mobile? How do we deal with social? How do we deal with this sexy thing I've just learned last night called big data? Anybody who thinks big data is, I mean, thinks no SQL is sexy, I got a problem with them, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, and we, guess what? You know, each of these pillars itself is advancing at exponential rates. We're showing very little sign of slowdown. Um, and compositely, we have something almost hyper-exponential. These together really suggest we really ought to be able to reframe the game completely. But the question is, are we? I want to suggest as a path towards thinking about some of the reframing, how might we actually shift our focus to potentially a slightly more radical frame in terms of how do we move from thinking about sickness to how do we think about wellness? How do we take this kind of notion of quantified self to a more extreme position? And more generally, Nancy, how do we move from a focus on just content to the context of everything that happens? Everything that happens in our body, everything that happens between our body and the outside world, and everything that happens in terms of how we work in hospitals and so on and so forth. How do we actually think about shaping context in order to actually change your behavior? Because we know an awful lot about how people should act better, but somehow our thought does not lead to changed behavior, and we have to come back to that. So let's look at these shifts briefly. Let's look at this first one, having to do with the shift of sickness to wellness. And I want to talk about this in terms of how do we shift from thinking about disease as a thing, a noun, to thinking about, for example, wellness. But wellness is dependent on the context that we are live in. In fact, this shift means thinking about kind of health and personal health care, not like a watch, not like a machine, but like an emergent, complex ecosystem. And I'm going to discuss a lot in a few minutes about what this notion of an ecosystem is and how do we actually work with complex, emergent ecosystems that are fundamentally not machine-like. And then how do we work with these systems in order to get new types of end results? Ecosystems, as we all know in this room, are alive. A, me a mechanical system, for example, a watch is divisible, while ecosystems basically are indivisible because of their well-developed, deep interdependencies. Because ecosystems are indivisible, their environment for all work feeds back into the system, affecting the entire system. This is what starts to complicate our game. In fact, if you look at Lee um, uh, Hood's work in terms of the P4 movement, where he's taking some of the deep, deep science, deep science, genetics, uh, integrated systems, biology, et cetera, et cetera, 
couple that with participatory platforms of games, Second Life, by the way, things like that. Um, how do we start now thinking about this ensemble more from an ecosystemic point of view? In fact, his movement says, let's, maybe there is a kind of a novel approach to individualizing medical care. How do we shift from waiting for a disease to develop to understanding the natural propensities of disease? How do we apply treatments or behavioral changes to delay the onsets? Um, how do we develop lifelong uh, life strategies um, of wellness plans for the individual? And how do we empower patients to create precise strategies to promote wellness, usually using social networks and gamification to cons get the consumer, the patient, to take ownership of their health record? And obviously, what we're leading into here, which you folks know more about than I do, is how do you make that shift from electronic health record to a personal health record? And how does that change the psychodynamics of the players, of the individuals themselves? How do they become engaged in new ways? Um, but much more deeply than that, being heavily influenced by David Agus's work, how do we start thinking about, for example, cancer as a thing, not as a thing, but cancerine? How do we shift from cancer as a thing to cancerine as a process, as an ecosystemic process, which is radically contingent on the proteomic context that it is constantly embedded in finding itself in. Um, we need, perhaps, to think about health and personalized health not like a watch, again, but like an emergent, complex ecosystem, as David would also remind us in this context. But here's the problem. I'm going to talk about more from complex systems point of view. You can embed it in your own particular spaces. Complex systems are large. Going to a poet, Walter Whitman's sense, because they're full of contradictions. They're full of unknown unknowns, as we have also discovered in fighting the Middle East. The unknown unknowns and unanticipated consequences. Basically, many of our medical problems today, many forms of cancer, not all, but many forms of cancer, might be defined as wicked problems. How do you approach wicked problems? you might ask. Well, that's said poetically. Let's say it's slightly more technically from Scott Page's point of view in his beautiful book called Complex Adaptive Systems. Quote, complexity arises when the dependencies among the elements become so important that removing one such element destroys the system's behavior to an extent that goes well beyond what is embodied by that particular element that is itself removed. This is a key property of complex emergent systems. This is one of the reasons why it's very hard to solve problems that are complex in the sense. But let's say it more pragmatically. If you cannot actually solve completely complexity, and you cannot even model complex systems, or let's say it this way, the system is the model, um, and I'm including in that agents uh, theory, et cetera, et cetera, which I won't bore you with, but actually don't really model complex systems in, in the deep, contextually contingent ways that I'm talking about. But if this is the case pragmatically, pray tell. What can you do? I'm going to claim that there are three things we can work on. The boundaries of the ecosystem, the probes, to be able to measure parts of the ecosystem that you guys know deeply about, and modulators, which actually help you modify this system as it's constantly emerging, constantly transforming itself, and so on and so forth. Said slightly differently, how do you listen to the feedback, the proteomic conversation that David Agus' group listens to between the cells in the body? Um, a very rich kind of conversation that's happening. It's almost impossible to get reliable measures to, but although they're developing some amazing new technologies to do that. How do you listen to the feedback? Augment and amplify what you find is good. Quickly remove the bad. Look for patterns and centers of gravity because you're looking for nodes of efficacy to actually do this. Now, you can think about that internal to the body. I'm going to talk about it as much external to the body in terms of how do you actually get major changes to happen in society in terms of thinking about wellness in a different way. 
So let's think about this briefly. What are these boundaries? What are these probes? And what are these modulators? The boundaries are the easy things to understand, especially if you go back to the P4 stuff of Lee Hood. Uh, boundaries determine the agents that constitute the ecosystem. Externally, for example, in terms of our patients, ourselves, age-related, disease-related, geographic, socioeconomic, a combination of these, blah, 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 blah. Uh, internally, as you can imagine, they're uh, epigenetic and, and genetic type of factors. These are the things that determine the boundaries of the things we have to work with. But the probes are different. Probes are things you put into the system in order to read the system. You all here know about the probes in terms of biochemical probes. I'm going to focus more for something you may not have thought that much about, having to do with the behavioral probes you may want to insert in the broader ecosystem uh, for this kind of wellness around this particular person. Um, examples of these probes more generally uh, are, for example, things like Fitbit, uh, the simple little thing that I wear, a trivial little device, accelerometer, that gives me every five minutes a pretty good readout of how energetic I've been so I can get a complete reading during the day, during the night, blah, blah, blah. That, of course, is just the tip of the iceberg. How might you actually do reality mining? Reality mining, because what we can now tell just from a cell phone in terms of real-time trajectory data, not time slices any longer, but the trajectories of what we're doing uh, as we move through a complex ecosystem, um, in terms of the, you might call it digital breadcrumbs that they drop, uh, we're coming out of the media lab. How do you do kind of social network monitoring? And how do you think about an obscure little topic called micro-narratives? How do you start to collect all the local stories of everybody in order to understand what might really be going on in that particular ecosystem you want to actually try to change? Very simple example of reality mining done by Sissad Sandy uh, Pentland and his group is just by actually looking at the GPS data coming out of a cell phone uh, with a set of people, being able to track that, you start to actually tell a lot about different groups of people, how they hang out, where they go, and so on and so forth. Um, these are brief little graphs that are happening. But the surprising thing is just by looking at kind of like what people you're close to um, kind of in that same vicinity, through time, you can begin to be able to reconstruct a great deal about the whole social network of that particular person. Uh, that's a little bit more surprising. Um, these are the kind of the clusters that he detects at MIT uh, where people hang out, and you begin to see how different groups hang out, not surprisingly, different places. Um, but let me back up a moment because that's all pretty obvious. I want to talk briefly about micro-narratives. I got involved with this for a bizarre reason. Both my colleague Ann the Pendleton Julian and I have been working on not health problems, although she's now looking at this in terms of health directly. Um, we were looking at, for example, certain issues in the Middle East and kind of wondering why we spend a tremendous amount of time in this country thinking about statecraft, but we don't think anything about streetcraft. The tools that our government uses are tools that talk top down. They set policies in place. They look at the responses to those policies and so on and so forth. Um, but there's no particularly effective way to start to actually scientifically mine the data coming from the street. What could you actually tell if you could begin to look at street craft? Because basically, if you really want to bring about major change in a region, um, you need to look at the top and you need to look at the bottom. And you need to look at how to bring these two things together. Now, a different kind of big data starts to happen here. Because uh, what you'd like to do, and when this was first done, and we can't talk too much about it here, uh, is actually move into a country like Afghanistan and try to take tens of thousands of micro-narratives of how people in Afghanistan are actually looking at different...